Good afternoon. Uh, joining me is uh, our Chief Legislative Officer and Senior Counselor, Kiefer Mitchell. And I'm also pleased to have Commerce Secretary Mike Gill, who, as of today, is once again leading the Maryland Department of Commerce. Welcome back, Mike. Thank you. Uh, next to our health recovery from the worst uh, global pandemic in more than a century, uh, nothing is more important than our continued economic recovery. Even with all the pressures of the pandemic, inflation, and the supply chain crisis, our state continues to have uh, one of the best economic recoveries in the nation. Our unemployment rate is the lowest it has been since before the pandemic, and we're adding jobs at more than twice as fast as the rest of the country. CNBC recently named Maryland as the single most improved state for business in America. We achieved that by taking swift and decisive actions and by keeping much of our economy open throughout the pandemic. We provided more than $2.1 billion in state economic relief measures. At the start of last year's legislative session, I introduced the Relief Act of 2021 as emergency legislation, uh, which included the largest tax cut in state history uh, and included $1.45 billion in urgently needed tax relief and economic stimulus for struggling Maryland families, uh, small businesses, and those who lost their jobs due to the pandemic. We sent more than 420,000 direct relief checks to Marylanders in need and more than $100 million in additional grants to small businesses, to nonprofit organizations, uh, in order to have a real lifeline uh, to those hardest hit, uh, people who were struggling to get by, and small businesses desperately trying to stay afloat. Last summer, we launched Project Restore, a $25 million initiative to help incentivize new business growth in order to create more jobs on main streets and in downtowns and communities all across our state. Because of all of these efforts and because we've had such a strong health and economic recovery, last fall I was able to report uh, that tax revenues are expected to be $1.6 billion higher uh, than projections and that the state of Maryland is now projecting a $2.5 billion surplus, which is the largest surplus ever in the history of our state. As I said when I announced this uh, surplus, we are not going to squander it on uh, mandated spending in increases or special interests. We're going to invest it in the hardworking people of Maryland, and we're going to leave our state in better shape for future generations. I announced a five-point framework for how the state of Maryland would utilize the surplus, which includes uh, bolstering and increasing the state's rainy day fund, major relief uh, for Maryland's overtaxed retirees, direct tax relief for working families across the state, additional relief for underserved Marylanders, and enhancements for state employees. Today, we are announcing the largest tax cut package in state history, which will deliver more than $4.6 billion in much needed relief for working families, for small businesses and retirees. I still hear nearly every day from folks who say, uh, I love the state of Maryland, I've spent my whole life here, and I don't want to leave my kids and grandkids, but I just simply can't afford to stay here on a fixed income. Uh, just last week, one Marylander told our office, quote, a growing senior population means more commerce and more economic vitality and a bigger tax base to pay for more state services. I couldn't agree more. Uh, but it's not just good for our economy. It's also good for our quality of life if our seniors can have the peace of mind to stay here where they spent their lives working and raising a family and where they contribute so much. This is the one area where we are still not competing effectively with other states. And even though we're one of the best places in America to live and we have so many great things going for us, 
we continue to lose many of our best citizens. Over the course of our administration, we have been successful in getting a targeted retirement uh, tax relief passed, especially for our hometown heroes, our law enforcement, fire and rescue, corrections, and emergency personnel, as well as for military retirees. But that's not enough. Uh, together with our friends in the legislature, we need to take bolder steps. So today, we are announcing the Retirement Tax Reduction Act of 2022, which will eliminate every single penny of state retirement taxes in Maryland, uh, providing $4 billion uh, in relief to Maryland's deserving retirees. Our proposal uh, will be phased in over time, beginning right away. Uh, eliminating retirement taxes is one of the most important things that we can do and something we've been trying to accomplish for seven years. In the past, the legislature has failed to support critical relief for seniors, and each year when I proposed it, uh, they almost uh, you know, immediately reject it out of hand. And they always have a similar response. They say, we just can't afford it. Well, with our increased revenue, our record surplus, and our growing economy, our fiscal health is now stronger than ever before, so we can afford it, and we must do it. What we cannot afford is continuing uh, to lose more retirees year after year. All that is needed is the political will on both sides of the aisle, and I'm ready and willing to work with anyone uh, to finally get this done for Marylanders. Uh, we're also introducing the Working Marylanders uh, Tax Relief Act of 2022 which would make the enhanced earned income tax relief from our historic relief act of 2021, the tax cut, make it permanent in order to provide working Marylanders another $650 million in tax relief. This was one of the most successful pr provisions of the relief act. It was uh, passed nearly unanimously and with, but with the support from Democrats and Republicans and hardworking families should not have to worry that this critical tax relief is going to be taken away from them. Uh, one of the most uh, transformative initiatives that we've launched uh, since I became governor is More Jobs for Marylanders Act, enacted in 2017 and then expanded again in 2019. Uh, this critical program incentivizes and encourages manufacturers and other businesses to create more jobs where we need them most. The results of the More Jobs for Marylanders initiative speak for themselves. Maryland is no longer losing manufacturing jobs. We're adding them. Uh, we went from being 50th in America to adding more manufacturing jobs over the last five years than 39 other states. Uh, the program has already helped dozens of companies, including Alertus Technologies, Caldwell Manufacturing, Clippy, Clipper City Brewing, Alliant Tech Systems Operations, just to name a few. And nearly half of all the major economic development projects that we have in the pipeline here in Maryland are manufacturers, and they represent uh, more than 10,000 new jobs. To continue to incentivize even more investment and even greater job creation across the state, today we are announcing the More Jobs for Marylanders Act 3.0 uh, in order to extend uh, the More Jobs for Marylanders program for another five years through 2027 to continue to make our state even more attractive, a more attractive place for manufacturers to start new businesses and to create jobs. Uh, today we are also proposing uh, additional small business tax relief by eliminating the $300 annual filing fee that is required for any entity that registers with the state uh, electronically. It's another uh, needless and costly piece of red tape for our smallest of businesses, and uh, we're doing away with it altogether. We're also going to eliminate the $100 annual filing fee for family farms. Uh, this reform would make Maryland the first state in the country to provide a zero fee option for all business businesses for all these types of filings. Uh, finally, 
we are introducing the Project Restore Act of 2022 to codify and make permanent a Project Restore, which is one of our most successful COVID-19 recovery initiatives. We have already had an overwhelming response to the program, awarding grants to businesses in nearly every single jurisdiction. And this bill will allow us to drive even more jobs and investments to our small towns and main streets for years to come. Uh, with all of the important announcements that we're making today, we are continuing our focus on delivering exactly what we promised, real long-term relief for hardworking Marylanders, small businesses, and retirees, creating more jobs and more opportunity in every corner of the state and continuing to lead the nation in economic recovery so that our state comes back even stronger and better than ever before. Uh, with that, we'd be happy to take some questions. Well, that's exactly what we have been doing for two years, and uh, well, that's the, the, the Relief Act that I introduced last year as emergency legislation passed I'm, either unanimously or nearly unanimously with the help of my colleagues across the aisle. And what I announced today was uh, expanding on the successes that we all achieved together uh, by working in a bipartisan way. Uh, that was the largest uh, tax cut in history, and uh, now we're taking it to another level and helping even more people. Yeah, I mean, uh, this th we're going to lay out our budget next week, but you know, we can show you know going out you know the, for the next five years of projections that uh, you know we're still we're still uh, have a surplus. So uh, we do long-term budgeting, and uh, all that's been taken into account, and we can afford to do it. Uh, you know, I, I I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but when I uh, was elected governor, we had a 5.6 billion dollar structural deficit, and we now have a 2.5 billion dollar surplus, and we're going to have one. For the foreseeable future, unless we, uh, you know, blow it by uh, some of the increased mandated spending that some of our friends are trying to propose. Governor Hogan, in, in regards to the cyber incident at the Department of Health, how long will it take to bring any systems that are still down back online, and how is the state coordinating with local health agencies in its recovery? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, this is something that uh, we have a huge team of people inside and outside the state government uh, working on day and night, seven days a week. Um, I receive briefings every day. We have provided uh, two detailed briefings to the presiding officers of the legislature. Uh, we've provided detailed briefings to the Board of Public Works, both the treasurer and the comptroller. And we fully briefed our entire federal delegation on the status of this. Uh, I believe that uh, health department folks and some of the cyber experts may have more to say about that later this week. Um, I can't share a lot more information or detail about it today uh, because it's an ongoing uh, federal investigation of uh, you know criminal activity that I, I can't compromise. But um, I think you know we want to be as transparent as possible but we also want to catch the bad guys. Um, you know a lot of the work has already been done but there's there is still more work to be done. You know, the concern is that uh, if you, uh, you know, try to flip everything up back on too fast, uh, you run into the same problems they've had in states across the country, like Texas, where you lose hundreds of millions of dollars and people's data is compromised. And that has not happened here, uh, but it's a little slow to get some of the systems up and they've had to do workarounds. And, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's not a great situation, but it's, uh, it's a lot better than it could be. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we did not get the data, um, and we're going to continue to press for the data. I know that, um, you know, the President of the Senate uh, is also interested in the same data and sent a letter to her. Um, we're just trying to, you know, this is, it should be basic information. We have it from almost everywhere else in the state. We're not getting it from her office. Uh, you know, she instead lashed out and, you know, started attacking me personally when all we're looking for is the data that, that she needs to provide to the state, and we're going to continue to press for that. Yeah, I'd rather not say. Governor, <laughs> uh, so, this is going to be your last full-time session coming up. Um, can you tell us about plans for the future and talk about some of 
some overtures and encouragement for you to run for U.S. Senate. Do you have any thoughts about doing that? Are you interested in running for U.S. Senate? Well, you know, we're, as you mentioned, we're about to start our, uh, my last legislative session. I think uh, we're, well, a week from today, I will begin my eighth year as governor. So we have a little more than a year left in this job, but it's a pretty, pretty all-consuming job. So as I've said a million times, I, I don't have a burning desire to serve in the U.S. Senate, and I, have a, I do have a burning desire to continue to focus on this job uh, completely every day. And that's what we are doing. We're in the middle of a couple of crises. <laughs> Uh, which we're trying to handle as best we can. We have a terrific team of people working. I'm really proud of all the work they've been doing uh, over the past seven years, and we hope to continue to run through the tape and, uh, and, and finish the job. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've got a little more than a year left. We're, we're going we're gonna to land the plane, run through the tape, and, uh, and finish the job they elected us to do. And then, you know, I, I, you know, I, just, uh, you know, I know a lot of people are speculating. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, my answer is the same. It's been every time they've asked me for the past year, and that's that I'm not really uh, interested in what the future political uh, possibilities might be. I'm just focused on the day job. Does that include future plans for running for president? I, I've said the same thing just about, and that is, um, you know, there's plenty of time to worry about that. We just started 2022. Certainly uh, don't have to start talking about 2024. Governor, back on the COVID front, does the state, would you like to see uh, a mandate for boosters for the state board? Uh, no, uh, we look. We are uh, one of the most vaccinated states in America. We're 92.6 percent vaccinated. Uh, it's a uh, you know I'm not sure how much better you can do than that. Uh, whether you have a mandate or not, we're doing much better than most of the states or the folks that have mandates. Uh, so we're going to continue with the very successful uh, strategy that we've done over the past 22 months, uh, which you know I think is uh, is the way most people are happy with. I, I don't see how it couldn't pass, quite frankly, when you have, uh, you know, this is something that people are, uh, you know, been demanding for a long time. It's the reason I was elected governor twice. Uh, it has the overwhelming, enormous support across the state. We can't afford to do it. Uh, they did pass. I did convince them to pass the largest tax cut in state history last year in the middle of the pandemic, uh, which is no, no other Republican governor in America has passed a tax cut with the Democratic legislature. And, uh, so wh why we couldn't expand on that and do it again, I don't know. Uh, I would, I would, you know, I don't quite agree with, you know, we, we actually did pass uh, retirement tax cuts four times. So we proposed eliminating reti uh, re all retirement taxes for military retirees, and they, they took a little chunk of it and said, we'll eliminate the first 10,000 of taxes. And then uh, we did the same thing for hometown heroes with cops and firefighters and first, you know, first responders. And they said, no, we're not going to eliminate it, but we'll give you the first 10,000. I came back again for all of it. They doubled it, uh, so we got four different tax, retiree tax cut bills passed already, and nobody actually disagreed with the goal of eliminating the retirement taxes. They simply said, you know, we're not in a position we can't afford to do this, and now we're going to show them that we can't afford to do it, uh, and it's what we should do. Last so, question. yeah. Anybody else? Uh, we, we did do that for a year and a half. Uh, we had a longer uh, moratorium on evictions than uh, six months longer than any other state, I think, in the country. We started it before the federal government provided it. But right now, our eviction problem is the lowest it's been ever, uh, much lower than before the pandemic started. So, uh, you know, with all the relief that we've put out, uh, it, it really is not as big of a problem as some of those advocates would lead you to believe. All right. Thank you very much.